Galatians chapter number 3. We're not going to start at the beginning of the chapter, but at the beginning of chapter number 3, the Apostle Paul, O foolish Galatians, is what he writes, who hath bewitched you. The church at Galatia had started believing a false doctrine. The people had slept in and started teaching something which was salvation, as Jesus said, for by grace are you saved through faith. Right? It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Right? Not of works. Why? So that man can't boast that they got their own salvation. Well, he, in verse number one, oh foolish, who hath bewitched you, he says. Right? Someone had to come in and deceive them, bewitch them, in order to get them to believe that in order to be saved, you had to do works on top of what Jesus did. That's what they were teaching. Now, the Apostle Paul didn't teach them that. That's why he said, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? He said, you had all you needed when I left. Well, what do we need? We need Christ. What do you need in addition to Christ? Nothing. All right, well, then he gets into a little bit of a discourse between what the Old Testament and the New Testament economy is. Under the Old Testament, they had the law. Okay, the book of Hebrews tells us that the law was our schoolmaster and that it showed us that we were sinful. The law was to prove to you that you are not perfect. Right now, there's a whole bunch of yahoos out in the world that'll say that they're perfect. Right, we know that they're lying because you can tell in their own eyes they don't believe it. Right, they still have to take showers like everybody else. Why? Because if they don't, they start to stink. Okay, well, I guess they don't have to, but I mean, if they want people around them, I guess that they would. Okay, they've still got to brush their teeth or else they're going to get gingivitis. Right, they've got to take medicine when they get sick or they may not get better. Right, they are not infallible. Okay, but the law was to show us and to prove to us that God was holy and that we are not. Okay, and under the law, there were certain sacrifices, there were certain obediences that were made, not because they would make you holy, but because that's what God said you had to do in order to be on good terms with Him. It was obedience. It was not anything that transformed you into someone that was holy or someone that was justified. We'll get to that word here in a minute. All that it did was fulfill God's requirement to, under the Old Testament, have your sins pushed back for a year. It's all that it would do. Your sins were still there. There was still a record of them. It's just that God had pushed them back a year so that if you were to die in that year, that you wouldn't be required to be accountable for your own sins. Okay, there was still a record. But the due date for that bill was just pushed back a year. Not because you did anything special, but because you did what God said to do under the Old Testament. Okay, well then, there's the New Testament economy. Well, what happened? Jesus came to fulfill the law. When he fulfilled the law, he became a kinsman redeemer for all men. But if you want to learn more about that, first got to go read the book of Ruth so that you can understand what the process of a kinsman redeemer was. But you had to be related by blood or by marriage to somebody in order to be their redeemer. That means if there was a debt that they could not pay, you could step in on their behalf and pay it for them. Okay, it means that if they were guilty of a crime, you could pay the price for that crime so that the kinsman could go free. Well, if you go study the lineage of Jesus, you're going to find two ladies in there. First one, her name was Rahab. Okay, Rahab had a whole lot of faith. Rahab had more faith than some of God's own people. That's why God's people had to die off in the wilderness for 40 years, because they didn't believe God. But Rahab believed God enough that she became one of God's people. See, Rahab, beforehand, her job was a harlot. But you see that she was from the town of Jericho. Well, if you go study out those that were from Jericho... Okay, we don't have time to get into it. But between Rahab and her lineage, 
And then you go a little bit further down, and then you're going to find that Boaz married Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. And if you study out the where Jericho came from and where Moab came from, any way you slice it, Jesus has the right to be a kinsman redeemer to anyone. Okay, first off, we all came from Adam. Then after that, we all came from Noah. Okay, we're all related somehow. But under the law, the kinsman redeemer, you had, there was a certain relationship that had to be established. Well, through Rahab and through Ruth, we got it both ways. So under the New Testament, when Christ came and fulfilled the law, what he's saying is, I've met the qualifications to redeem someone. And then there was the process where he stepped in, okay, or interceded on our behalf. That means that he stepped into our shoes and faced the judgment that would have been meant for us. So when you look at what happened on Calvary, Christ was judged for my sin and for your sin. He paid the price that was required because of my sin and your sin. Well, the wages of sin are what? Death. Right? Sin required a blood payment. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But see, in the Old Testament, the blood of a perfect lamb would push the sins back for a year. This isn't the blood of goats and animals that Christ... No, this was the very blood of God that paid your sin debt. That's why in the New Testament, he can say, you know, instead of your sins are pushed back, your sins have been forgotten for a year. No, your sins have been forgiven. They have been paid. They are gone. You know what that means? There's no more record of it. If you took out a mortgage from a bank to pay, a, you know, to buy a house, once you pay it off, that thing called a lien, that goes away. A lien means that somebody has a stake, right, or you owe something to somebody else, so they get to put a tag on your property that says, until I get back what's mine, I have a right to this house. Right, if you stop paying your bills, what happens? They're going to take what they financed, and they're going to go sell it to get their money back. But the agreement is, is that it's yours as long as the payment's made. But once the payment's paid in full, what happens? The lien gets taken away. There's no more record of it. They don't care about it no more. Why? Because they got what they required to make the lien go away. But see, your life had a lien on it. You know what that lien was for? It was for hell. Unless a payment was made, your soul was going to spend all of eternity in hell. Not because God didn't love you. Not because God didn't make man perfect in his image, but because man chose to sin. Because you were born a sinner, you chose to sin. You were a sinner by nature and a sinner by practice. You chose to be what you were. It wasn't out of your hands. You chose to do it. And because of that, a lien was added to your life. You wrote a check that was too big for you to pay. Right? That check was going to bounce. You didn't have any righteousness. You didn't have any holiness. So what happens? Christ, a long time ago, stepped in and said, I'll pay the price beforehand. You didn't know this, but Jesus paid for your sins before you was even born. He didn't just pay for your sins. He paid for all sins past and all sins future. Because the Bible says that he died for every man. So the payment had already been made. But you had to accept it. Somebody can write you a check. In fact, I've been guilty of this before. In fact, I'll tell them this story right now. Okay, we went on vacation on a cruise around my birthday. Well, Christian and Thea, being dumb, handed me my birthday card when we were on the way to the airport. So it just got put into my luggage. Right? I was not ready to receive gifts. I was ready to go on vacation. Okay? So it just got stuck in all my stuff. Well, what happens? Well, the next time I went to go take a trip, which literally was about four months after, I'm like, what in the world is this? And I pull something out of my traveling backpack, and I'm like, that's a birthday card. Why do I have a birthday card in the backpack that I haven't used? Oh, since my birthday. And guess what? There was a check in there. It still hadn't been cashed. Okay? Tay is angry at me. Why? Because I missed the point. Okay? But see, that check, right? It was written. But it didn't do me any good. 
because I forgot about it. I forgot to cash it. Just because you have a check in your wallet doesn't mean that it's going to do you any good. Just because somebody's willing to pay something for you doesn't do you any good unless what? It gets applied. You receive it. It's got to go into the bank. But what happens when you come and ask Christ to save you? What you're saying is, Lord, I accept your gift, and will you please apply it to my account? He had already done everything, but by faith you believe that he was who he said he was, the Christ. And that you accept that, one, you're a sinner and you repent of your sin, but two, you accept the payment which he offered to you. He said, why in the world? There's no way that he said all of that in ten verses, Brother Jordan. He said a whole lot. And that's what he was talking about. So when we get to verse number 11, it says, but that no man is justified by the law is evident. Okay, the law in the sight of God it is evident for and then here he's quoting the just shall live by faith okay, you can go over and look at Habakkuk chapter number 2 verse number 4 direct quote from the Old Testament so it doesn't matter if you use Old Testament or New Testament guess what it took in order to live a justified life before God faith you know what the law was the law was something written you could go up and you, if you knew how to read Hebrew, you could go up and you could read the law. You could go down to the temple and you could have the rabbis and you could have, you know, the Pharisees or the scribes read out the law of God unto you. It was something that you could hold. It was something you could touch. It was something you could see. But see, the law is not what had the power. The law was just a set of instructions that God wrote down. What made the law special? That it came from God. What was the law's purpose? The law couldn't save you. The law couldn't change you one bit. The law was to show you that you wasn't as big and as bad and as special as you thought you were. In fact, you were lowly. That you needed something that you couldn't provide for yourself. The law was to humble you and to teach you that you were sinful. So what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was so that you would trust that what God said was what you needed to do. Well, in the New Testament, what's the purpose of preaching? Well, the purpose of preaching is so that others will hear. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear without a preacher you know what the purpose of preaching is is to tell people what Jesus did for you you know what the purpose of telling people what Jesus did for them so that some might hear and want to accept that gift right when they hear about what it was Christ did for them what does that produce it produces more faith and with faith you are able to trust in God God gave unto every man a measure of faith but some people, that faith has to be, you know, has to be grown a little bit. God's got to do a little work on them so that they use that faith to trust them. How's that happen? Through His Word, through the preaching of His Word, through the evangelism of His Word, through the propagation of His Word throughout the world. But see, verse number 11 says, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. You know what that means? It's clear. It's proven. No doubt about it. So when it says justified, we've got to figure out what that word means. Best definition of the word justified is just as if I've never sinned. To be justified means that all memory of what was before has been erased and has been replaced with what God has done. When you pay off that mortgage all paper trail that that used to be owned by whatever bank that's gone it's yours now it's only yours bank can't come back and say well I financed that once I don't care this piece of paper says that it's all theirs right that loan has been just as if it had never existed it's as if you had bought it from the beginning all along but when you get saved what happens Everything that you used to be is forgiven and forgotten, 
and God turns you into that new creature. The world may remember what you were, but God doesn't. But it's evident that justification doesn't come by a list of rules and regulations. The law, you can keep every jot and tittle of it, or try to. But you know why that wouldn't have been enough? Because there's only one person that could have fulfilled every jot and tittle of it. His name was Jesus. You could strive to keep every law, but guess what? You're going to fall short. Right? Trying to overcome or change what you are is above what you are able to do. Now don't take me the wrong way. The Bible says as a man thinketh, so is he. Your mind is very strong, very powerful. Your heart is very powerful. In fact, your heart's deceitfully wicked. No man can know. You don't even know what's in your own heart. But you can change the outward appearance. You can change your habits, you can change your position or your status in life, you can change how others see you, but the change we're talking about is one that was an everlasting change. Right? Smoke and mirrors is what made magicians right? as popular as they are today. You can't figure out the trick. Well, how did they turn that around? But the truth is, is that if you get a peek behind the curtain, you can figure it out pretty quick. That's why magicians only let you see and act from a certain angle. Because if you saw it from the side, it wouldn't make much sense anymore. You could see all the wires, or you could see the gimmick. Really, no change has happened, but it looks like it. It's all facade. But it'd just be like if you kept your house the exact same way that it was. Let's say that there was a house that was, you know, the roof was falling in. Okay, the foundation needed to be repoured. Okay, there's termites everywhere eating all the wood. Okay, insulation's gone. It doesn't stay warm in the winter and it doesn't stay cool in the summer. Right, the house is a mess. Well, you could put up one of those Hollywood-style facades, right? Put a cardboard box around it and paint it to make it look like you had rebuilt the whole house. That's just an outward facade. It literally means, right, it's a deception. Nothing has changed, but you've made it look like something's new. You can do that to yourself. The arm of man is strong enough to change the outward appearance, but it's not able to change the soul of a man. That requires a touch of God. Doesn't matter how many rules or regulations you keep. Doesn't matter if you try to be holy as God is holy. In your own strength, you're going to fail. The law did not come to set you free. The law came to show you that you were bound. The law came to shine a flashlight on your life so that you weren't groping in the darkness any longer. You weren't blind. You were able to see that you were chained by this thing called sin. So when he says, in verse number, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. God never said that the law was going to justify you. God never said that the law was going to change you. God said that the law was to show you that you needed a Savior. And that as long as you, by faith, accepted that God's instructions were enough to keep you until the Savior came, that everything was going to be okay in God's eyes. The law didn't say, the law just kept pushing back the appointment that you had with God until Jesus came so that he could pay the payment for you. How did all them Old Testament saints get saved? Same way that you did, by the blood. The key is, is that that appointment that they had with God to, you know, have the payment for their sins demanded, that was pushed back until what? Until Christ came. That's all that the law did. The law didn't change you. The law didn't justify you. Okay, but, it goes on to say, for the just shall live by faith. Now in order to be justified, what has to happen? you got to get saved. What does that word justified mean? It means it's just as if you had never committed a sin in your entire life. That you never will sin from the day that you got saved forward. That in the eyes of God, as long as it's under the blood, it never existed in the first place. So when he gets down to 
the latter half of the verse where he says that the just shall live by faith justified is a verb past tense meaning it's already been done so if you've been justified it means that you're already saved well after you get justified what does that make you it makes you just because justified means that you took something that wasn't just and you made it just as if it had been just all along so when he says that the just shall live by faith he's talking about saved people how did you become justified well Jesus paid the price from the beginning of time he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world Right? He paid for your sin, but in order to become justified, you had to use the faith that God gave unto man and exercise it to trust in Jesus. And then you became justified, meaning that you were just from that point forward. Okay, It doesn't say that the lost shall live by faith. It doesn't say that the sinner shall live by faith. Those that are dead in trespasses and sin have no idea what faith is. Because they haven't used it yet. They've got it. God gave just as much to them as he gave to you. But they haven't used it yet. Because God gave you the exact thing that you needed in order to trust on Jesus. Why well, do you know that? Because he gave a measure of faith unto every man. Every man got the same amount. Which was just the amount that you needed. So before you use that faith to trust in Jesus, you're not just. Because you can only be just after you have been justified. Make sense? We're going somewhere with this. So when he says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. He said, we all know. Right? He just spent ten verses pr proving to him again all the things that he had already preached to the church at Galatia. That's why he called them foolish in the first verse. Because they knew better. But by the time he gets down to verse number 11, he says, it's evident that no man gets saved by the law. But he says, the just shall live by faith. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the church at Galatia. These people are already saved. They know how they got saved. They were there when it happened. The Apostle Paul knows how they got saved because he was there preaching when it happened. But right? he's not writing to their church letting them know that y'all didn't get saved by the law. So why would you trust in what he's dealing with here, circumcision, uncircumcision. He's dealing with salvation plus other things. Right? Today we deal with baptism. Don't need to be baptized to be saved, but you do need to be baptized to be a member of church. Salvation has nothing to do with getting dunked, getting dripped, or, you know, things dropped on you. Salvation is a work of God. Baptism is an outward show or a work of the flesh to show that you identify with Christ. You died in your sins with him and you are risen again in new life. That baptism is a requirement for membership, not a requirement for familyship. Kinship, that's the word I was looking for, not family ship. Anyway. Tell me, oh, I'll go back and listen to that, and you'll get it. You know, the family Familyship, that's not a word. No, it's not. I just made it up, and then I couldn't remember the right one. So when he says, the just shall live by faith, he's talking about people already in the family. You're not just if you haven't been justified. So he says, it's evident you didn't get saved by the law, so why in the world would you think that the law is what would keep you just afterwards. They already know that they're saved. He's saying, why in the world are you trusting in works after you get saved if works wasn't what it took to get you saved? He says, the just shall live. Why are you just? Because God made you just. But in order to stay just, you have to live as thus saith the Lord. Did not Jesus say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments? But see, these were not following out of love or admir admiration. They were trying to keep a set of rules so that they could appease God. They wanted a clear list of what in the world do I do so that God is happy with me. If only that were that easy. I've got a real short list, but you're not going to like it. You're going to have more questions. 
The list consists of Christ. That's it. You got to be Jesus in order to meet God's satisfaction. Now, Brother Jordan, what's that mean? You got to be Jesus. Because he's the only thing that he accepts. He accepted his son on Calvary as the payment for your sins. Why? Because he was perfect. Well, after you get saved, how are you justified? To where God doesn't see you on it. Well, first it was forgiven, but then he knows that this flesh is still sinful. So God doesn't want to look at your flesh because your flesh is not justified. Your soul is justified. So what's he do? He robes you in the righteousness of whom? Christ. Why? Because God's got a very short list of what impresses God, Christ. So when he looks at you, he sees Christ. What's God's requirement list? Christ. What are you going to be like for all of eternity? You're going to receive a body like his. You're going to be fashioned exactly as Christ is. Why? Because there's one thing that God accepts, and that's Christ. It's still going to be you, but it's you in Christ. Why? Because that's what it takes in order for you to be justified with God. So if that's how you got saved, why would you expect anything different after you got saved? You know what it takes in order to have God's approval in your life? To be in the smack dab perfect middle of God's will? You've got to be as much of Christ as you can be. Christ has to be so much in you, and you have to be so much in Christ, that you can't tell the difference anymore. That's what God expects. It's a point where you end and Christ begins. That's what God expects. That's the purpose of spirituality. That we decrease and he increases. We get as small as we can so that he can get as big as he can. That's what God expects after he gets it, but people don't like that. Because that's, you know... A concept that we can't wrap our heads around. Well, how in the world is Christ... Well, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, is what the apostle said. It's not the works that I do. Because if it were works that I did, they'd be the works of man. The works of man fail all the time. The arm of flesh will fail you. But there's one that we know that if he does it, it's permanent. Why? Because one day he said, let there be light, and the light's been shining ever since. And it's going to shine for all of eternity. In fact, go read the book of Revelation. You know what the light is in New Jerusalem, New Heaven, New Earth? It's Him. How was He able to turn the light on? Because He was light. And He just took a little bit of it and flung it out there and said, stay there for a little bit. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? It's not about you. It's about Christ in you. Why are we accepted in the Beloved? Because we've received His mark. I'm in him and he is in me. I've been made a part of Christ. He added me to him so that I could add him to me. That we could become one and the same. I know, we're getting out there. We're in a little bit of the deep. We're not too deep. We're not going to go shark territory. But what are you saying, Brother George? What does God expect? That's a different list for everybody, but he wants you to be like Christ. But what's that mean? Well, today that can mean something completely different for you than it could for me because God's working on us in different ways. But you know what the end goal is? He wants us to be like Christ. I can't give you a list. No man can give you a list. If somebody says, here's what you need to do in order to be right with God, mark that joker. Because he's lying. You know what you need to do to be right with God? Be exactly as Christ is. If you fall short of that, guess what? You still got work to do. But we all got the same goal. It's Him. What's the measuring stick? Christ. What's the example? Christ. That's what God expects. So when the apostle wrote, the just shall live by faith, he's saying saved folk shall live by faith. Why? Because that's the only way to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. How did you get saved? By faith. How do you think you're going to live after you get saved? By faith. We spent way too long on all of that. We're probably going to run out of time. But what we're talking about is living faith. That's what we want to teach on. The just shall live by faith. You were justified. God made you just. But if you want to stay just, guess what you got to do? You got to live by faith. 
Do you know what so many people's problems today are? They believe that if they do this, this, and this, that they're okay. Show me chapter and verse on that. I find that a man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. Either you're all in love with God or you're not. Do you know what the benchmark is? Is to love the Father as the Son loved the Father. Do you love God as much as Jesus loved God? Because that's the goal. Well, Lord, I don't even understand, you know, let alone all of this book, let alone the half that's never been told. Faith can cover a whole lot of what you don't know. God doesn't expect you to figure out all that God is doing in your life in order for him to do it. He just expects that you trust him to do it. Too many people are putting a whole lot of stock in what they do. And I'm talking safe folk. He's writing to a church. Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? They'd become altogether miserable. Why? Because they were trusting in what they were doing, not in what God was doing. If you look at what you do, if you look at what I do, you're going to find a whole lot of fault. You're going to find a whole lot not to be impressed with. But he does all things well. His ways are above our ways. His ways are past finding out. But we do know that all that he does satisfies. It lasts. It's permanent. If God does it, man can't undo it. Isn't that what the St. Hedron Council said about you know, James and John and Peter and the apostles? They said that if this be a work of man, it'll fade out. But if God's doing it, no man can stop it. If this is a work of God, you're not going to be able to stop it. Because what God settles is settled for all of eternity. What God places, only God can move. The just shall live by faith, not by works. You weren't saved by works. Why would you live by works? Now, James tells us that faith without works is dead. If you believe something enough, you're going to go do something about it. If you thought this building was going to catch on fire today and there was nothing we could do to stop it, you'd be telling everybody if you really believed it. You'd be telling everybody to get out, stay away. This place is going to go up. Just avoid it completely because harm is going to come to you if you go in there. You may be able to get out in time, but it's best to just not go in at all. If you really believed it, you'd be telling everybody. Do you really believe that, you know, the Brent Spence Bridge was unsafe to drive on, that it was going to collapse? You'd be out in the middle of I-7175 with a sign that says, don't go on the bridge, it's falling today. You say, well, you might get hit by a car. If you really believed it, you'd think it was worth it. Because you're trying to save other people. In order to get on the bridge, they're going to have to go through you. What are you saying, Brother Joe? If you believe it, you live it. But you're not basing your faith and you're not staking your hope off of what you're doing. You're just following God's instructions. Here's a good example. You want to know why faith, and a lot of people have a problem with faith, I'll give you an example. Tithing. People believe that if they tithe, that they're okay. Nope. Why do we tithe? Because God told us to. But you know what tithe, the purpose of tithing is? You have to, by faith, believe that God can make 90% minus your offering. So now you're already below 90%. Right? Minus anything that faith promise given God put on your heart. Minus those things that you sacrificially give because you believe that it's better for God to have it than for you to have it. So you should be less than 90. But it is an exercise in complete faith to denounce the logic of the world and economists and everybody in your life that says $1 minus 10 cents is not enough to go out and buy something that's 99 cents. That's if we take tax out of it. But if you go to the store and something costs a dollar, you can't buy it with 90 cents. The thing about tithing, it's not about you being obedient, although God does reward obedience. The reason that tithing is such a powerful thing in a Christian spirituality is because it forces you to have faith. If all your faith is based on the fact that you're writing the check and that God has to bless you, no. 
The just shall live by faith. Lord, I'm giving this to you because one, all of it's yours. If you wanted all of it, you'd have taken it. But you gave it unto me. You said to give unto you of first fruits. The Bible says. That means not after the tax has been taken out. Not after everybody else has got paid and here's what's left over. No, God gets the best. So he gets the first cut. Now that's kind of hard to do when the government already takes the taxes out of it before they, because they can't trust other people to pay what they owe them. Right, so you get your check with all that taken out. Well, they give you a little itemized line called gross, not net. And you figure out, oh, that's what I was supposed to get paid before everybody got their fingers in the pot. But what's God get 10% of? The big number, not the little one. Because by faith, you're saying God can make 90 go farther than 100. Now, that don't make sense to this. That don't make sense to the world. Don't make sense to a calculator. But you know who it does make sense to? God. Tithing's not about the work. Tithing's about the faith that you're living on. Right, let's give you another example. It's not about, we know the Johos. Okay, the JWs. Jehovah's Witness. Their faith is staked on the fact that if they do enough, they'll be one of those that's left over when the kingdom comes. They don't even know if they're going to get in. Why do you think they work so hard? Because they're trying to outwork other people. Right, they can't outwork God, but they can outwork you. Because you're flesh. So their faith is, is that they're going to do more than what you did. Their faith is in what? They did. It's in their works. Doesn't matter how many tracks you go out and give out, it's not going to make you any closer to God. See, people have the carpet bomb mentality that if we just get a Bible to everybody in the whole world, that'll be a step, a whole lot closer to everybody getting saved. Maybe. Maybe. You say, what do you mean, maybe? Maybe. I believe that you go and you witness to those that the Lord leads you to. I believe that the Holy Ghost is not only supposed to lead and guide you into all truth, the Holy Ghost is supposed to lead and guide you in every step of your life. I believe that according to the Bible, why did the Ethiopian bump into Philip that day? Because Philip was led by the Spirit to wear a chariot. And guess what happened in the chariot? There's a fellow leading or reading the Old Testament saying, this don't make sense to me. How'd Philip end up in the middle of nowhere with an Ethiopian in a chariot? God took him there. You know I, who I believe you should witness? And I believe we should go out and we should spread the gospel, propagate it. But I believe before long, before you go, you ought to be praying, Lord, where do you want this to go? Lord, who do you want me to share this with? Because I believe we're supposed to be st good stewards of the things of God. I don't think it's right to take God's money from God's bank account. Right? Go rent a B-52 bomber, fill it up with a whole bunch of tracks, and then just dump them all over northern Kentucky. Shows a lack of faith. Well, God, I'm just going to dump it, and you let it get to where it's supposed to go. Now, I should believe that the one that I'm holding is exactly what the person needs. You ought to get a burden for that person. You know why faith is so important when it comes to witnessing? Because if it's based upon what you're doing, it's never going to be enough. Was the person that told you about Jesus enough to have come and found you where you were, then get you into church, then eventually get you to a point where you understood the difference between right and wrong, that you was a sinner, that you needed a Savior, and were they enough to pull on the heartstrings of your life so that you would come to the realization that I need Jesus and that you'd use faith to believe on Him? No. Well, how do you say that, Brother George? Well, somebody brought me to church. Hallelujah. But they weren't the ones that got you saved. If they were enough to get you saved, Jesus wouldn't have had to send the Holy Ghost. Why did you get saved? Because no man coming to the Father except Jesus draw them. Who did that? The Holy Ghost. You may have received a track, but you know why you got that track? Because the Holy Ghost wanted you to get that track. Because somebody prayed and said, Lord, where do you want me to leave this? Who do you want me to give this to? Go out and spread the gospel. Absolutely. 
But don't be basing it on you know where to send it the best. Go to where the Lord leads you. Give to whom the Lord burdens you about. Because anything else you're trusting in your knowledge over what God said. Just, well, I go out and I knock on doors. Hallelujah. But are you knocking on the right doors? That I don't want one of them things called auctioneers to meet me at the door. Hey, how you doing? Would you like to come to church with me? Thank you. Here you go. Here's this track. Bye. Say what? If the door closed, I'd turned around and I'd looked at somebody and said, did I just have a stroke or did that really happen? You really think that's going to make an impact on somebody's life? Or do you think, hey, I've been praying about this. God wanted me to give you this. They said, well, that doesn't make much sense to me. Well, all I know is that I, God gave a burden to give this to you. I want you to know Jesus loves you. I love you. If you got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Right? But God cared so much about you, he wanted you to have this. That's got a little bit more impact to it. But what if they, what if they start asking questions? All you got to do is tell them what Jesus did for you. But what did Jesus do? For, if you need to ask that question, maybe Jesus never did anything for you. But if you need a refresher, he took you from the muck and mire of the world and changed you into something new that you couldn't do for yourself. It wasn't a new leaf. It was a whole new life. He came that you might have life and life more abundantly. What did he do to you? He cleaned up those stains that nobody else could touch. Those things that you hated that kept you up at night. Those things that made you feel so guilty and you knew there was nothing that you could do to change it. He made it as if it never existed. He did for you what no man could do. What are you supposed to go when you tell people in witness? Your life should be a testament of the fact or a witness that Jesus did in you what no person could do and only God could do. Proof that somebody got saved is that they lived like Christ afterwards. Faith is not about works. But if you've got real faith, your life's going to show it. The just shall live by faith. It doesn't just say that the just shall work by faith. Although everything that you do should be done out of 100% faith. If there's any doubt, get in the altar, or get in your prayer closet, or get in the Bible. Say, Lord, help mine unbelief. Because it's doubt that kills what God wants to do. There's never been one instance where everybody believed and God didn't do. It's always that some believed, but some had doubt, and it was the doubt that caused God not to be able to do what God intended to do. But see, to live by faith is not just by working. That means that you're driven by faith. That means you're directed by faith. It means that you discern by faith. Have you ever heard the audible voice of God, Brother Jordan? No, but I've heard him. You ever gotten a letter from God telling you what you need to do? Yep. But Brother Jordan, has he ever showed up and physically showed you? Nope. But he's pointed at the direction that I needed to go. By what? Through the, the lens of faith. It's the essence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You're never going to be able to lay hands on it, but you can live by it. You have faith. Whether you choose to use it or not, it's up to you. But see, the just shall live by faith. How did you become just again? Because Christ justified you. But see, something that's just can become unjust. It can become tainted again. Do you take something that's perfect, immaculate, it's spotless. You drop it in the grime. When you take it back out, now it's got grime on it. See, Christ justified you when you got saved, but you haven't been staying just. Because you haven't been living by what? Faith. You know what causes you to step in a different direction? Unbelief. Because faith will keep you right behind the, crowd, the right behind the Lord. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He was our forerunner. He's already paved the path. He lived it. 
Why? So that we could become partakers of it. Nothing has been left undone for you to live a perfectly victorious Christian life until Jesus calls you home. Nothing lacking, nothing missing. Everything's been done. You just got to believe that he can do it. That he can take you and make you into what you need to be. That he can keep you what you need to be. Well, what's that take? That takes me believing that when I mess up, he's able to forgive it. But it also takes enough faith to say, Lord, I don't want to be in control no more. You turn the car. I don't want to lean on my own understanding. No, I should trust in the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. Why? Because we lean not on our own understanding. Your mind can't figure out God. Everything that you know about God, God had to tell you because you weren't smart enough to figure any of it out. You couldn't figure the puzzle out good enough to figure out who Jesus was unless Jesus told you about Jesus. Everything you've got is because God allowed it to come into your life. Everyone that you know is because God arranged it that you would meet them, that you'd be in contact with them. Every breath that you take is one that God put your initials on because God's got a number on everyone's head. That means he knew how many breaths you were going to take just like he knows how many hairs are on the top of your head. Everything in your life has been ordained, orchestrated, or allowed to happen by God. So knowing all that, up until the point you got saved, why wouldn't in the world, right, what would possess you to think that God expects you to do it after you get saved if he took care of all of it before you got saved? Doesn't make sense. How'd you get saved? Because God did all the work and you believe that what God did was enough to save you. So you repented of what you were and asked God to make you something different. So why would you think after you got saved that you'd be able to live any other way than how you got saved? Through faith. You really think that you're going to improve upon what God did when he saved you? No. No. They, nobody has come to me and asked, you handed me a paintbrush and said, Brother Jordan, you used to watch a lot of Bob Ross on public access TV. We want you to come in and make the Mona Lisa better. Well, I could start off by doing that. She's pretty ugly. I don't get it. But nobody's asking me to improve upon famous works of art. God's not asking you to make yourself into something better. He says he'll take care of that. But the just shall live by faith. You want to know why, even though you were justified at Calvary, many people aren't living just today? Because they're not doing it through faith. They're doing it through works. They're doing it and trusting in themselves. They're trusting in a list of things. They're looking at what they believe it takes in order to live holy. But God said, no, to be holy, you've got to be like Him. Amen. And if you could make yourself like God, you wouldn't have had to been saved. Well, if I'm not able to make myself like God, how in the world am I going to be holy? By faith. Lord, I believe that if I'm obedient to do what you tell me to do, you're able to do what I cannot do. How are you holy when you're robed in his righteousness? How do you get access to the glory of God? You've got to be God. God told Moses that he'd let him see his glory. But Moses didn't get to be a part of his glory. Didn't get to be a partaker of it. Didn't get to grab some of it and say, Hey, everybody, look at the glory of God. How do you see the glory of God? You've got to be God. You've got to get to the glory of God. How? By being God. Boy, are you God? No. One day I'll be like him. But even when I'm like him, I'm not him. Because the only reason I look like him is because he made me into it. But one of these days I'll be able to get so close that the Bible says one of these days I'll sit on his throne with him. Well, in what order is that going to happen? I don't know. Because he says the last shall be first and the first shall be last. That means it's going to happen in the order that God wants it to happen in. But one of these days I'm going to sit right next to him. How am I going to get so close? Because he made me like him. It's not because of what I did. It's not because I earned a seat on the very throne of God. No, 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 no. He made me a joint heir. He, one day, will give me a body fashioned just like his. Why? So I can be right next to him 
and be a partaker of his glory. It's not about me. I'm, everything he gives me, I'm going to give it right back. I'm going to cast it at his feet because it was all for him anyway. Well, Brother Jordan, if you're not making yourself into what you are, then how in the world is things getting done by faith? It's not about what I can do. It's about what he'll do if I get out of the way. It's not about what I can make my life into. It's about what he can transform my life into if I just give him the reins of my life. It's not about how I can do things for God. It's about what God can use me to do for him. It's a completely different mindset. It's not about how much you do or how many of this you've done or who in the world you've been doing it with. It's about whether you walk step by step and day by day in what? Faith. Because that's how you were justified and in the eyes of God, that's how you will remain just. Because he said, be ye holy for I am holy. What's he expect you to be? Just as he is just. That's why he justified you. Because the only thing that he finds acceptable is just. So how do you maintain just faith? How do you wake up and say, Lord, even though I know that I am sin, you know, wrapped in sinful flesh, that my heart isn't saved and it's deceitfully wicked, that some of the very thoughts that I have, Lord, I can't even control those, let alone being able to make myself over. So Lord, make me into the image of your son. Make me aware of what I can do, and Lord, get me out of the way on the things that I can't help. Make me into what I need to be, not what I want to be. I don't know what's best for me. You don't know what's best for me. God does. God knows exactly what you need, how to give it to you, and give it to you in such a manner that not only you can receive it, but never lose it. Because he wants you to have it for forever. Well, how's he able to deliver that if you just get out of the way and let God move? Say, Lord, I believe you can do exceeding abundantly above all I can even ask or think. I believe that if I call unto you, you show me great and mighty and wondrous and marvelous and excellent things that I know not. Because you're bigger than I am. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.